Today we're going to discuss five potential blockbuster trades involving Flames forward Matthew Kachuk. The way things are going with the salary arbitration and reports from the media, it sure sounds like a trade is pretty much inevitable. Plus, we also have a few signings to discuss and some more details on the Hockey Canada scandal from the 2018 World Junior event. We'll discuss all that coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have some Matthew Kachuk trade stuff we're going to talk about here uh, in a few minutes. And But first, we have a few other news items to talk about, including a couple of NHL signings today. Uh, the New Jersey Devils have signed newly acquired goaltender Vitek Vanacek. Uh, he gets a three-year contract at $3.4 million per season. So that's a pretty fair deal, I think, for what he's accomplished so far in his young career. Uh, hopefully he can push Mackenzie Blackwood and they can form a pretty good tandem here with the New Jersey Devils. Uh, I know there was some talk that Blackwood may very well be on his way out. And I guess longer term, that still might be a possibility. Assuming Venacek is the better goalie this year, which I guess time will tell, but if he can outplay his counterpart, um, I wouldn't be shocked if Blackwood is maybe traded during or at the end of the season, and uh, maybe they'll find a new backup. But then again, they may very well work good as a tandem, and it might be in their best interest to maybe run with both goalies. But today's NHL, the way the schedule works and everything, having two pretty solid goalies is certainly not a bad thing so we'll see how Blackwood plays this year and how he can bounce back uh, the Philadelphia Flyers have also announced they've signed one of their young uh, I guess he's still kind of a prospect but he's kind of getting a little bit older now that's Isaac Radcliffe uh, he gets a one-year contract but again a two-way deal 750000 at the NHL level essentially uh, accepts his qualifying offer so um, he gets under contract with Philly. Now, of course, as I mentioned, we have some more updates regarding the Hockey Canada scandal involving the uh, the event that took place uh, in the 2018 World Junior Team in London, Ontario. Um, certainly not a um, you know a good scene at all. As the days go by, the more information that we learn, it seems to get worse by the day, and it's a pretty sad state of affairs. And I do honestly really question after what we learned today if Hockey Canada can even continue to exist as we know it. Uh, it's some pretty uh, condemning information in my opinion and of course like uh, it's only going to get worse I am sure there's more hearings with the uh, committee the, that's formed by the federal government I believe it's July 26th and 27th I don't know if we'll learn much more between now and then but the information seems to be coming out reporters are digging uh, and here we go so today we learn that Hockey Canada has had for some time um, I don't know what you want to call it, but a separate fund set aside of uh, upwards of $15 million at any given time here that it has used for the sole purpose of handling lawsuits and settlements. Now, of course, Hockey Canada as a corporation would have insurance. They would have insurance against being sued and being liable for a lot of things, right? Um, but that obviously insurance would cover a lot of these things that they would be concerned about like the stuff that happened in 2018 but they have a fund set up to handle these things privately without going through insurance um, and it's believed that this has been funded through uh, registration fees so think about all the registration fees a hockey canada would collect in a run of a year so all kinds of hockey hockey is so big in canada like it'd be crazy what it could collect right so um so yeah so they're getting all this money set aside from registration fees and basically using it to cover up complaints so that it doesn't go public because obviously the more involvement and insurance and all that the more likelihood that something's going to come out if they can settle it and get things out of the courts then of course you know the likelihood of it ever becoming known is gonna is not gonna it reduces drastically and especially because they can get a non-disclosure agreement signed so like okay well we're gonna pay you off but then you're gonna sign a form saying that you're never allowed to disclose anything about it it's between us privately and that's the end of the story and that's common i mean it's common with a lot of settlements it's not like it's an unusual practice but in this case it's just really Disgusting when you think about the fact that all these people that could have over the years, and I don't know how many other situations there could have been, have been guilty of stuff that's really deserves severe punishment, are getting you know off the hook here and getting paid off by ho Hockey Canada brass. Like it just doesn't seem, I like guess, it's, it's so wrong on so many levels. And if you think about like all the executives, everybody who knows, even the you know, 
I just don't know how they can continue. It's so disgusting. Um, I, I don't. I don't know what's going to happen. I really don't know. Uh, there's lots of players now that have spoken out. There's. Uh, I don't want to speculate on who the players are that are involved. It's believed there's eight players, but I'm not based on all the reporting and everything that I've read. I'm not 100% convinced that they're all eight players are from that junior team. They were all um, junior age hockey players. That much we can say. Um, but I don't know that they're 100% all from that team. Now, I will say this. We've also learned because reporters have been digging. They've reached out to various NHL teams, uh, the NHL PA, uh, as well as agents that represent all of these players looking for comment. Um, some have given a statement, some have not. There's still a large group that has not said anything. I want to caution again. I see people on social media saying, well, these eight to 10 players haven't said boo, haven't said a word. They must be guilty. This is probably who we're looking at. That is incredibly irresponsible to do. Do not drag people's names through the mud without having any evidence. Uh, that is not wise whatsoever. I don't think that's fair. Uh, just because a player hasn't said anything doesn't mean that they're guilty or innocent or anything. They might have their reasons. A lot of things to factor in. I just don't know that it's wise on any of our parts to go on social media and speculate on who the players are. But I do know that there is uh, a group of the six of those players are all represented by Wasserman Hockey Group. So they all have the same agency. And they appear, based on a global news article that I've read, and I'll, and I'll pin that article down here in, in the top comment, it seems like they're all represented by lawyers. So I don't know if that's just that agency, you know, trying to look after their people. Do they have more reason to need a lawyer? I don't know. It, it's hard to say, but there is a and then global news article, article. It goes through and it's more up to date and more current than a lot of other stuff you're seeing on social media. And it goes through each player. I guess the fact that the, the news people tried to contact the player's agent, NHL or AHL affiliated team or whatever team they're currently with right now. Um, or like, uh, or anybody that's like, well, I guess the agencies and teams mostly, or the NHLPA, and for the most part, they haven't heard back a whole lot. And just because too, you got to remember, there are some players that have, have statements out there that are they're kind of being brushed with the not guilty brush, and their statements are either from themselves or in some cases from their agents, saying that they don't have any knowledge of the situation, they cooperated or that they had nothing to do with it. And that's fine and dandy, but if they feel they're not guilty, they're not gonna come out and say anything else. Uh, I don't know that making a statement saying, yes, I didn't do it, is enough. How many people go to court, did a crime, and claim they were not guilty? It happens all the time. Just remember all that. Like, I don't think it's fair that people are going on social media and saying, well, these five or six players have put out statements saying they didn't do it, so it's gotta be these guys. That's so wrong, so irresponsible. You don't want people threatening players, ganging up on players, or spreading misinformation because, to be completely honest, we don't know. Nothing has been identified. Nobody's been charged. Nobody's been proven guilty. So I think people should pump the brakes when it comes to all that kind of activity. And just follow the proper news people. As the updates come out, we'll talk about it. I'm not going to ignore it, even though it's a touchy subject and something a lot of people probably don't. You know, I know there's probably people out there that may be questioning if they have a YouTube channel or if they're in media of any sort, should they be talking about it? Should they be covering it? I'm not afraid to, to, to tackle the tough subjects. I never have been and never will be, but I'm also not going to try to incriminate people when I don't have evidence. So we'll see. It's a messy, messy subject. It's getting uglier by the day, and I, I almost think it should be torn down to the ground, start it fresh with the right people who can change the culture, who can change the mentality and move forward in a new completely new direction because it's just completely absurd of uh, the stuff that's gone on that we didn't even know about because it's been covered up it's bad and it needs to change and there's no reason for it you know so hopefully uh we'll get more answers i know the nhl wants everything sorted out before training camps will roll around um so they can complete their investigation and if there is going to be any punishments handed down that they can deal with it before the season starts, right? Um, I know, obviously, the Hockey Canada is, is launching a new investigation. What that's all going to include, we don't know. So the other thing, too, that we also learned is that there is two videos taken by 
uh, the players or one of the players or from the happen. I was taken at the event. The two videos essentially are the female um, who's alleging the accusations here uh, were very, very short videos where she says that uh, everything was consensual in one of them. And the other, she says that she's sober. Uh, of course, we haven't seen the videos, um, but uh, certain people have within, uh, you know, the legal world and uh, they've, they've commented on it. But of course, the videos are not made public. But you got to think too, like that again, which, you, you know, I understand that they was probably used to uh, d defend them, but you're in a room, you're ganged up on. If everything's happening the way she said it did, don't you think she's going to say and do whatever she feels that she needs to to get out of there safely? Um, she could have been pressured into that. Like to me, that's not the fact that they felt the need to do that is not, uh, uh, it doesn't look good. Um, secondly, like, there's also a text conversation between one of the players, which I assume is the first player that she talked to, because she does, I, be, I believe the statement of claims, like she met one player, everything with him was consensual, but it's what happened afterwards where he brought in a bunch of his hockey player friends is when things became non-consensual, uh, is what the allegations are. And that, uh, I believe, that I we assume right now, that based on this text conversations, that it's perhaps him i don't know for sure though that's texting with her the next day confirming if she went to the police she says that she didn't want to but her mother did and he's trying to convince her that that was wrong that you know and that you know there's going to be serious consequences here far from over this is going to be one of the biggest stories we follow all summer long now the matthew kachuk saga we know that matthew kachuk and the calgary flames are headed for arbitration but it's not player elected arbitration this is the second window here for club elected arbitration which is not a common thing you don't see it very often but obviously where the player chose not to go to arbitration that left the option open for him signing his qualifying offer which would be a one-year nine million dollar deal uh which expires as of july 22nd so sometime before the end of the week he could have just signed it and says yes i accept he has a one-year deal he's a free agent next year end of story making nine million bucks can't negotiate an extension until January. Number two, it also would have left open the possibility of accepting an offer sheet if another, another team comes along, gives him an offer sheet contract that he likes, team he wants to go to, he signs and accepts. Calgary, of course, can match it, but it shows that he wants out, so what do you do, right? It probably depends on the compensation. At the end of the day, those options are no longer available because now they're officially in arbitration. Um, however, he's going to end up getting a deal if it goes through arbitration and actually is settled through that. He's going to get a one-year deal of at least $9 million. It could even be more. The arbitrator could say, yes, he's due at least nine, but based on how he played last year, he should get 9.5 or 10 or whatever. And whatever that number is on a one-year deal, then that's his contract. It's just that simple. And it's going to be a one-year deal because he's only one year away from being a UFA. If he was a little bit younger and had more RFA years left, then usually the arbitrator does offer, you have the option of getting a one or two year deal. Uh, and the, the, the player or the team, depending on who elected it, the opposite side gets to pick the term. All that's off the table now, so they either sign him to a long-term deal and avoid arbitration, go to arbitration, get a one year deal, he's a free agent next year, they're faced with the same scenario that they just dealt with with Johnny Gaudreau, or they, if they come to the conclusion, and hopefully he's upfront and honest with them, if he doesn't want to be there, that they make a trade. Now, of course, a lot of people think that this is going to come together quickly. He's either going to sign, because he does, he'll either say, yes, I want to be here long term, let's get it worked out, and they'll get it done before the arbitration case, or they'll make the deal. Now, I've put together five blockbuster mock trades, in my opinion. Uh, there could be lots of other teams in the mix. But keep in mind, Matthew Kachuk here holds a lot of the leverage. Because no team is going to trade for him if they cannot get him signed long term. It's just that simple. Why would you make that deal unless you're confident you're getting a long term contract, right? You're going to give up a lot. It's probably going to take about four assets, I think. In most cases so here's what i've put together five potential huge contracts where i think it makes sense for the team to want and acquire him that makes them a lot better they take a big step forward uh and at the same time here where he may consider playing number one the toronto maple leafs now of course the maple leafs as we know have had a hard time getting out of the first round uh, matthew kachuk is the exact kind of player that they're missing i've said before they need more bite more grit in their top six 
He's all that. He's like a unicorn player. There's not a lot of players that fit his description right now in the league outside of maybe his brother and a few others. There's not a lot. So what would the Maple Leafs have to give up to have a chance at acquiring Matthew Kachuk? Well, for starters, they're going to have to clear some cap space because they don't have any. So they're going to have to send enough money to the Flames to offset what they're bringing in. So I'm thinking of William Nylander, who's got two years left at 6.9. Alex Kerfoot is making three and a half. So there, there's your money for cap purposes to get him in. Uh, you're probably looking at a first round pick and either a prospect or like a mid rounder. So I'm going to say Nylander, Kerfoot, a first and a third or a fourth. Or you could replace that third or fourth with like maybe, uh, you know, a prospect that's maybe not an A prospect, but like, you know, a decent one. That, to me, would stand a good chance to get a deal done. Now, a couple of reasons why I think Matthew Kachuk might actually be open to playing in Toronto. For one, he's played in Canada for a while now. He knows what the markets are like. Uh, not only has he played there himself, his dad has before, too. They, they know, and his brother does in Ottawa, so they, they're well-versed in what it's like to be in the Canadian market. Uh, of course, he's an American-born player, um, knows Austin Matthews very well, did have a brief uh, junior connection to Mitch Barner, uh, through the London Knights, so there's certainly connection there. So he knows those guys well. Could be an excellent fit. Uh, would know other people on the team. I don't think he's adverse to. He's not shy for the attention and everything that comes with playing in Toronto. Um, obviously, Kyle Dubas would have to talk to him about a contract, but if, if that seems agreeable to me, that does make sense. Now I'm not sure that would be exactly how the deal would go down, but that to me would be a, a good starting point. Team number two, the New York Islanders. We know Lou Lamarillo needs to swing for the fences this offseason and get himself a top-line winger to play with Matthew Barzell. Well, nobody would fit that description better than Matthew Kachuk. He would be a tremendous addition for the Islanders. Now, this is going to be tougher. I think the Islanders will have a tougher time to meet the needs of the Flames should they actually be you know, seriously in contention here. But I think they can put together a pretty good package. I think we're looking at a couple of young forwards and Anthony Beauvillier and Oliver Wallstrom. So they get a couple of solid young scoring wingers. First round pick for next year, and maybe either a mid round pick or a top prospect like William DeFore. Uh, of course, William DeFore is a power forward type of player, just scored 50 goals in the QMJHL Memorial Cup MVP. He would hold a lot of weight in a trade right now. Uh, the Islanders, you know, obviously would be losing out, but how often do you get a chance to get a guy like Matthew Kachuk? I think you could live with yourself for that. That's four pieces from the Islanders. Now, they're not going to get as high in, like, the, the Leafs already have an edge here because Nylander's a better player than the ones mentioned in this trade, but there's also more salary where the Islanders would certainly have to probably shed another contract to another team or something like that because, you know, cap-wise, uh, that's not going to free up enough money to get it done. They're going to have to do a cap dump, whether it be Josh Bailey or somebody else would have to go to another team. Next up, the Ottawa Senators. A lot of people like to talk about the fact that it'd be awesome to have the Kachuk brothers together, and I'm sure that Brady and Matthew would be open to that. I, it'd be really hard to do, though, if you're Ottawa. They already made a lot of moves. They don't have a ton of cap space like they used to because they've added some really good players that are not cheap. However, I think the only way you would have to do it, if you're if you're Calgary, would you not ask for the newly acquired Alex Dabrinkit? 40-goal score. Matthew Kachuk scored 40 goals. Now he's getting more assists so than Dabrinkit, so he had more points. I don't know if that would be a one-for-one, one, but I don't think they'd have to add a whole lot more than, than Dabrinkit. I mean, similar age, similar goal-scoring production. Kachuk seemed to be getting some more assists, but overall, like, really? Like, I think that's a, you know, I don't, but Ottawa want to trade to bring it who they just got? I don't think so. I can't see it. But the concept of having the Kachuk brothers together would be intriguing. Otherwise, you're looking at, I don't know, some kind of combination of a first-round pick. I don't know. You're looking at somebody out of your top six, the only one, yeah, maybe like maybe Matherson, Brandstrom, Formington. I don't. I don't know what they would have. To, some kind of concoction of those kind of those kind of players. But I don't really see Ottawa wanting to do that. Uh, as much as Ottawa probably could put together a package that would intrigue the Flames, the idea of having the Kachuk brothers together is, makes a lot of sense. I'm sure they'd love it. I just don't know. I'm not really sure that that's gonna happen. Uh, I think it's less likely, but I think uh, Calgary would want to bring it and I, I see that being a, a no like a stop right there where they just got him and i think to bring it as much as you could say matthew kachuk just as good or better player i think at the same time um it, they just got to bring it he's a great fit for what they have and i think they would probably leave it at that uh new jersey is another one it was rumored that the draft the devils were making an offer including the number two overall pick to land matthew kachuk i don't know what else was all involved here in this deal uh but the devils were 
right up there talking to the Flames, and they were kind of going on the speculation that Gaudreau might leave and that the Flames might have to move him. So they were right up there. Now, of course, that pick is no longer in play here, um, but you got to wonder what else could they do. Well, we're looking at some young players that they could include that would be intriguing. You're looking at like Jesper Bratt, maybe Dawson Mercer, a 2023 first-round pick. Um, that's some pretty good starter. They'd have to likely add something else to it as well. Um, but that's, I think, a really good starting point. New Jersey has lots of other interesting players as well. Can you imagine Kachuk playing with a guy like Jack Hughes? You know, that's an intriguing thought, right? So, again, I think New Jersey would be in the mix. They were heavily involved in the Johnny Gaudreau sweepstakes, and Gaudreau even talking on the Spit and Chicklets podcast made mention that he thought he was getting a deal done with the Devils. They were really close. The Jack has called at the last minute. And he's like, no, I think I'd rather go there. So, you know, that was a, a close call. Of course, there's the hometown St. Louis Blues. You have to think they'd definitely be in the mix. Might even be Kachuk's preferred place to go. Um, there's been a lot of speculation dating back for like a year now about a Tarasenko for Kachuk trade. I don't think that's a one-for-one one deal given Tarasenko's age and contract status. But it could be something that could be included. But I think that the, the Calgary Flames are probably more looking at players like Jordan Cairo, first-round pick, maybe some of their younger players like a Bull Dew or a Neighbors, something to that effect. I'm not saying they would be totally against taking Tarasenko, but they're going to want a lot more than that, I think. Um, but St. Louis would need Tarasenko's contract off the books to have any chance to make it work. They probably wouldn't want to move Cairo. Um, but they'd have to include, if, if Tarasenko is going to be the main roster player going, then I think they're going to have to include their first and a couple of good young prospects like Jake Neighbors and Bull myself, um, at least. So we'll see. And, of course, you know, there's no guarantee Tarasenko re-signs and stays in Calgary. They'd probably want some kind of reassurance that they would make that happen. And, of course, I said there was five potential blockbuster trades. Well, I'm going to give you a bonus one here as well, and that's Columbus. They already stole Johnny Gaudreau. Why not try to get Matthew Kachuk as well? Uh, obviously, reunite Kachuk and Gaudreau together uh, in Ohio. I mean, we know we were all shocked when Johnny ended up there. Wouldn't we be just as shocked if Kachuk ended up there too? I mean, what could Columbus deal for Matthew Kachuk? Well, I think they could put together a pretty good offer myself from a roster standpoint, salary perspective. We know they're having a hard time coming to terms with Patrick Laine. He's been a 40-goal scorer in the past. Maybe they consider moving Line. If they can get Matthew Kachuk, I know they want to keep Line, but suddenly Kachuk's on the radar. I, I think they make that deal. You throw in a, a one-year contract remaining for Gus Nyquist at $5.5 million. Now all of a sudden the cap in Columbus is better shape, so you can probably make that work. You get a year of Nyquist. You get Line. Throw in one of their new young defensemen that they just got in the 22 draft, maybe Yurichek or Matejchuk, one of the two. First-round pick. That's four assets. So you get a young top defenseman, a first-round pick, Nyquist and Line. That's not a bad deal. You know, hard to say exactly what the asking price is going to be. I'm sure it's going to be through the roof, but those are some real blockbuster trades. So what I want to know from you is uh, where do you think he's going to end up? Will he sign in Calgary? Will none of these deals happen? And if he is moved, what's the most likely destination? Which of my trades do you think is the most likely? Or do you think there's another place that's even more likelier? Where could he end up? I mean, according to Eric Francis of Sportsnet, which we got to take everything from him with a grain of salt. He thinks this is all going to be wrapped up and done within a week, but to him, he's convinced Kachuk is being traded. Some other media are too, but there's also some that are being more optimistic and saying that this essentially will buy the Flames time to get a long-term deal done, and they're hopeful it will. So only time will tell. Let me know what you think. We'll discuss in the comments. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with the latest news, rumors, and analysis on all 32 NHL teams. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time.